a guided meditation. It's an analytical meditation that has some visualization. One of the benefits of having guided meditation is that it can be more elaborate because you don't have to remember all of the steps. And when you're by yourself, it needs to usually be a bit more simple because you're trying to look at the content as well. So um, uh, as soon as we do the meditation, then afterwards I'll do whatever questions there are so far, and then I'll move on to single pointed meditation. Okay, so if you want to get yourself nice straight back and with your posture, just feel like your, feel like your spine is like a, a stack of coins stacked one on top of the other. So before we start the meditation, just relax the body into the posture. You can imagine a string going up through the crown of your head, pulling you up and that same string going all the way down your spinal column, down through your tailbone, connecting you to the earth. So both grounded and uplifted, connected earth and sky. And just let your body settle into place with that imagery. And shift your focus from the body to the mind and set a very strong motivation. I'm going to meditate on loving kindness in order to deepen my experience of it, in order to bring it out in others. May there be a ripple effect from my practice from my heart to others. And may all of this mental energy lead to the development of our fullest potential so that we can be of greatest benefit to all living beings. And then just for a few minutes, we'll focus on the breath to allow the surface distractions to settle. So with the sound of the bell, gently shift further and further inward onto the breath. If it helps, you can take a few deep breaths intentionally in order to relax further. But after that, just focus on the natural rhythm without adjusting. Just choosing this one simple thing, the breath. And you keep returning to your awareness of it again and again on purpose.
And now visualize seated next to you on your left side is your mother or your mother figure, whether she's living or dead, whether you had a good relationship with her or not, just imagine her seated there beside you, facing the same direction, the sort of clothes and colors that she traditionally wears, her face in a neutral expression. And as you think of your mother or your mother figure, think of the different hopes and fears of her life, the different aspects of her personality, and just kind of bring back to mind a general sense of her. And then think, this person is just a human being like me, who wants happiness, who doesn't want suffering, who is sometimes skillful and wise in achieving those aims, is sometimes unskillful, sometimes selfish, sometimes selfless, just like me and try to just be with the humanity of your mother and the sameness of the two of you in just wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, even though it looks different. And then think from your heart center, loving kindness takes the form of warm golden light. And it spreads from your heart center all through your body. And you wish yourself well, soothed from any drama with your mother, inspired by any wisdom from your mother. And as you become filled with warm golden light of loving kindness, you send it to the left, filling your mother as well, wherever she is. And you think to her, may you be well, may you be happy. And then you picture also at your left, your other female relatives, any grandmothers, sisters, aunts, nieces, daughters, whether they're living or dead, whether you had a good relationship with them or not, and try to see their faces and one by one wish them well sending them goodwill in the form of golden light. Bringing each one peace, relief, contentment.
And the golden light blanketing any of those you don't remember. And come back to center, the golden light at your heart, continually radiating light throughout your own body, soothing your own mind, a wellspring that is bottomless and never ends. Love that is free from attachment and expectation. And you shift your focus to your right side. And you imagine seated at your right side, facing the same direction as you, is your father or your father figure, whether he's living or dead, whether you have a good relationship with him or not. Imagine his face in a neutral expression, the sort of clothes and colors he wore or wears. Thinking of his different hopes and fears, personality traits and gestures. Just get a sense of him being there next to you. And think of his humanity, the way he was driven by wanting happiness, contentment, satisfaction, not wanting suffering, discomfort, or pain, just like you, just like all sentient beings, even if his behaviors and expressions were different than your own. Try to feel the sameness of that underlying drive Just wanting some peace of mind. Just wanting some contentment. Just like me. And you can think that anything you've learned from him adds to the joy at your heart. That happiness and loving kindness that continually fills you. And you allow it to expand and radiate out over to the right side, filling your father wherever he is, bringing him peace. And you think to him, may you be well, may you be happy, as he's flooded and filled with golden light. And you expand to all of your male relatives, living or dead, those that you relate to, those that you don't, those kind and unkind, and try to see their faces and one by one wish them well, sending them each the golden light of your loving kindness. Grandfathers, brothers, uncles, sons, nephews. May you all be well. May you all be happy.
and come back to center. The loving kindness at your heart still filling you up, even as you radiate out left and right. Now shift your focus to behind you and think of the person in your life who is not related to you, but who you care about the most. Maybe your best friend or your spouse or your mentor. Whether they're still alive or not, imagine them seated behind you. stable and present with so much affection for you. And even as you know how incredibly loving this person is, how kind they are, you know also that there are probably people in their life who did not like them, who didn't experience them as kind, that this dear one is still just a human being motivated by wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, just like you and your relatives and all sentient beings. And so try to just be with the humanity of your loved one without getting hooked into attachment. And from your heart center, you send loving kindness in the form of golden light straight out behind you, filling them up, bringing them peace and well being. Thinking, may you be well and may you be happy wherever you are. and the light stretches out behind you to all of your loved ones of your life that you're not related to by blood. Try to see their faces, wishing them well. The space behind you flooded with light, covering and filling all of your loved ones. And then come back to center, feeling the love and the happiness at your heart center, still like a wellspring, never dry. And shift to the front of you and imagine seated in front of you, facing you, is your enemy or someone you deeply dislike, who has harmed yourself or others whose face you don't wish to see, you nevertheless picture it. Whether they're living or dead, whether they were in your immediate life or a public figure like a politician, just imagine them seated there facing you. Their face neutral, the sort of clothes they wear, the gestures and expressions they have, the sound of their voice. And you think this difficult, problematic, harmful person is driven by wanting happiness and not wanting suffering, just as I am just as my relatives and friends are. Only the behaviors and choices are different. But the underlying drive is the same. 
Try to feel that shared humanity, even if you don't agree with their choices. Try to dig for some empathy, some connection between you. Some sameness. And the golden light of loving kindness comes out from your heart, forward, filling them, bringing them peace, which might be the very thing that settles their bad behavior. But at least it protects your mind. So fill them with loving kindness and wish them well the deep wellness of self-awareness, of compassion and kindness. Think as genuinely as you can. May you be well. May you be happy. And the light stretches out in front of you, covering and filling them and stretches to every other person who you dislike and have aversion towards, who you think of as harming yourself or others. Try to see their faces and wish them well, one by one or as a group. And see if you can radiate the golden light of your loving kindness equally in all four directions. If you can make your goodwill equal, even if your relationships are different, even if your level of rapport and affinity and connection is different, all of that can remain different but allow the underlying goodwill to be pervasive and equanimous as best as you can without forcing it, even in all directions. And the light goes further and further out to your acquaintances, to strangers, to all the human beings, to all the animals, to all sentient beings, the world and the universe become flooded with light. And the light blurs the distinctions between us until all that is left is light and connection and goodwill. And then we add to the visualization, the compassion and wisdom mantra of Chenrezig. Om Mani Padme Hum 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 And the light comes back and absorbs into your heart 
deepening your loving kindness and equanimity for all living beings. And gently relax your attention. Okay, so um, that's uh, one of Lama Yeshi's kind of classic loving kindness meditations. And um, some days it works better than others. Some days you feel more connected to other than others, but um, adding a visualization can help bring it more deeply home. Um, did you have any questions about that meditation or analysis before we move on to single pointed? Yeah, I, I thought it was quite interesting, Venerable, because uh, you know how we have the saying, you know, all families are dysfunctional. Mm. You know, you have a problem with your, and we have, we have problems with our, specifically have problems with our parents. And then imagining, it's a very interesting how you said one on one side, one on the other side, and no matter what kind of relationship you have, you know, imagine them. That can be difficult. Yeah, <laughs> that can be yeah. Difficult. Yeah, you might and want to sit them next to you a little bit farther away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, what, would, what would you say, because can that turn into an obstacle as you're meditating? You're, or can that, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, I found that. Or would you replace mother and father with your caretakers if it doesn't work? What, what would you say there? Because it's very interesting. I mean, you know, the, there's another meditation where we use like the mother archetype, right? The sevenfold cause and effect um, for developing bodhicitta. And the premise is that you start with the idea that all sentient beings have been your mother and then you remember their kindness and wish to repay their kindness. And this is very triggering for Westerners because it's like, but if all mothers, if, if I see all sentient beings as having been my mother, then my relationship with all sentient beings will be complicated <laughs> you know and why is it a good idea should I do that I don't know um you know so in that case they say you know use the mother archetype or use an example of someone who's been very kind to you if your own mother doesn't fit the bill in this meditation it is that it's actually good to use your literal mother or your mother figure even if she was a terrible mother and use your actual literal father or father figure even if he's terrible because the point of the meditation is equanimous loving kindness and compassion you know so it's it's easy enough to say I put, you know, these relatives here and these relatives here and my loved ones here and my enemies here as if they all stay tidy in their quadrants, you know, but of course there's infiltrators, you know, going in between all different quadrants, you know, some of the relatives sneak into the enemy section and some of them sneak into the loved ones, section. you know, it's not tidy like that. But in the meditation, you can kind of compartmentalize and make it tidy because the point is to ev eventually dissolve all labels anyway. So you start with the labels, you're naming the labels, you're feeling your resistance, you're feeling your, oh, I don't want to love them as much as them. You're feeling your lack of equanimity, but you're doing the meditation because you want more equanimity and you want more loving kindness. So you're like, you know, up for it, even though you're like grumpy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I found it really powerful, Venerable, how, you know, it really puts you on the spot, no mm. matter what kind of relations with your own mother and father. It really puts you in, you know, in check and you're facing it. You're seeing it as, as you meditate. Thank you. That was really amazing. It's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I'm glad I, I like that one a lot. Um, and it's yeah. useful to see where if you're sending light in one direction or the other and you're going to the rest of the group, you know, you're like, oh yeah, grandma, grandma, nieces, nephew, sister, you know, <laughs> like if, if your light does, doesn't want to touch them all evenly, then you notice that it's, um, right, it's right. useful. Like it it's really a useful knowing. You Mm, it really helps you see your mind as well as you do it, as you try and cultivate that equanimity. So thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, thank it's, you. Um, that one is in uh, How to Meditate by Kathleen McDonald, which is, of course, old uh, Lama Yeshi meditation. So if you ever want to look that one up. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll do a couple of the questions in the chat and then I'll do some uh, single pointed meditation. 
Um, so my friend uh, Chris has popped in. I hope you don't mind. Um, he's <laughs> he's from the states, and he's asked, "Is there a difference yeah. between meditating with your eyes closed versus looking at images for visualization?" So um, this is a really important question because sometimes we'll have like um, a single pointed meditation. It's recommended to use a Buddha statue about this size you know, um, with a sense of light brightness, as well as a sense of weight. And you use the same one and you look at it a lot. You look at it when you're walking by your altar, but when you actually meditate, don't look at it. You're using your memory of it. Yeah. So when you meditate, you're actually not looking at anything. You're anything that you visualize, you're bringing to your mind's eye. So what you've actually seen is to trigger your um, generic image or the memory that you put in your mind that you bring out in meditation. So if you're meditating single pointedly on the image of a Buddha, here's your literal one and you go, okay, yep, yep. He's about that size, shape and color. And then you close your eyes and bring your memory to your mind. Or if you're meditating on a candle, you look at a candle, get a sense of the candle, then close your eyes and remember the candle. Yeah or the moon or whatever you're meditating on. So this is referring to single pointed meditation practices um, that use a mental image to steady the mind. Often we use the breath, right? And it's not like you can see the breath, but what you're actually doing is using kind of your memory of the breath that just happened. Cause it's kind of impossible to be with the exact breath that you're in. You're kind of just like a half a second behind you know, the breath that just was. So using the breath um, is very much recommended for settling surface distractions. When you And when you start to settle, it actually can be deeper and more useful if you can shift from breath to a mental image when you're doing single pointed meditation. Yeah. And if you can use a virtuous object, something that uplifts your mind, then you have, um, it's more efficient. Because if you visualize the moon, which is neutral, um, then you might be getting good concentration and developing a skill of concentration, but you're not kind of making any positive associations in the background. Whereas if you use like a Buddha image or an inspiring image from your own religious tradition, you've got a background association of, you know, compassion, wisdom, calmness, peace, that is informing the way you're able to hold the image. So it's useful to use a virtuous object. Um, then there's the question, eyes open, eyes closed. Some people visualize with their eyes open that they just shouldn't be looking at anything. You know, your, your eyes are open to let some light in, but you're, you're not like staring at your meditation object. You're bringing it to mind and just kind of maybe eyes half closed, um, maybe three quarters closed, all the way tightly shut is not necessarily a good idea unless you're really distracted. If you're really distracted and you're having a lot of trouble settling down, then close your eyes all the way. Yeah. Um, if you're prone to sleep, though, um, then just a tiny bit open so some light gets in, but your eyes don't get dry. And uh, I'm attached to my family and I was crying when imagining them and I have fear of losing them. And I find it difficult to deal with this. Do you have any advice for that? Yeah, that's, that's a really important one. Um, thinking about your family can be complex, <laughs> right? Um, you might be thinking, uh, don't go. You might be thinking, please go, um, you know, <laughs> or depending on the day. Um, but when you're feeling that real, I don't know, grief stricken, um, I cannot bear the thought of them being gone feeling. I mean, the first thing to do is give yourself compassion, you know, and feel connected to the human condition. This is something that is universal and avoiding that feeling is going to make you a disassociated person who's less empathic to those around you. So first feel the grief of that and know it. But the second step, if you have some mental space, maybe not in the crescendo or the climax of your grief, but just kind of when it's settled a little bit to check in with Again, what's the accurate observation and what's the irrational response, both. And it is true that there are people in our lives who have been very significant because of the connection and the transformations and the shared experience and all sorts of things have made this significant for us. And 
when they're no longer in our life, that is significant and worth noting <laughs> and worth honoring and worth celebrating, definitely. But when you feel like you cannot be happy without them, that is attachment. So a recognition of loss, a recognition of their significance, completely logical, completely excellent, really important to do. But going to the other extreme and thinking I can't live without them or I can't be happy without them or they're the only one that could ever be this or that for me, that is not true. Yeah, no one has been the source of your happiness. No one has been the source of your happiness. No one has given you happiness, right? What has given you happiness has been your own mind's responses to conditions or the ripening of positive karma in response to conditions. And some conditions are very powerful, like certain loved ones, but they are not the substantial cause of your experience. And you can kind of step back and think, what if I was to spend one whole day with this person? Would they feel identical the whole day? Or would there be moments of closeness and distance? Moments when I was very happy with them, moments when I was annoyed with them, moments when we related, moments when we didn't relate. And just kind of like remind yourself that you've created a snapshot in time of the peak experience of this person and decided it was them always and you can't live without that. When in fact that snapshot in time of them at their best or your relationship at its best wasn't even the most consistent thing. That wasn't even the way things were. So you're telling yourself stories and then, you know, it's like building castles made of sand and then the waves come in and you're disappointed, but they were always made of sand and you made them anyway. Yeah, so, so I'm not wanting to minimize the significance of these relationships because, I mean, there's certainly been people in my life who, when they've passed away, it's been very significant and my life has changed a lot with them not being there. And we have to look at kind of the societal pressure that says, if you're happy after they're gone, it must not mean that you love them, which is nonsense right? They would want you to be happy, wouldn't they? Like, for goodness sake, they loved you, you know? So if you're like holding on to this identity of a grief-stricken person as a way to prove your love, no one is benefiting from that. And, you know, and you're disempowering yourself from growth and happiness, you know? So, um, so if you can separate what is a, a kind and rational assessment of love and significance from the attachment that says I can't be happy without them because you were happy without them even when they were alive they weren't always right next to you every second of every day you had many times of happiness unrelated to them existing right there in front of you yeah it's delicate so be really nice to yourself with these examinations and don't do the, them in the height of your grief just kind of be with your grief very kindly as if you were your own best friend and really hold yourself with the pain of it. But then when the grief wave goes, you know how grief comes in waves? Then when it's a bit settled, ask yourself the, the harder questions. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so we're getting a little bit late, I apologize. So I'll just quickly go through single pointed meditation, which is not hard to understand at all. But um, I wanted to reintroduce or introduce you guys to um, the classic picture. There are nine stages to developing perfect single pointed concentration. And the reason I bring it up is that um, it can help reassure us that the problems we're having are the problems that all sentient beings and all meditators have had when trying to settle down and just focus on one thing. That we're not weird for being distracted, that there's nothing wrong with us, that our concentration is inconsistent. So the nine stages of sustained attention or mental abidance, these are the steps to achieve what is called shamatha, Shine, serenity, or calm abiding. These are all synonyms, and they mean a concentration arisen from meditation and accompanied by the bliss of mental and physical pliancy or ease, in which the mind abides effortlessly without fluctuation for as long as we wish on whatever object it has been placed. So you're in that flow state where you're able to focus without effort, but the focus is also not drifting or dulling or getting distracted. And this is something achievable for all of us. It just takes some time. 
Okay, so um, I think we'll just skip through these because we don't have a lot of time. Um, but a really good book is Following the Footsteps of the Buddha by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Thubten Chodron, if you want to read more about this kind of attention. So the preliminaries, I, I just wanted to name them because it can help you understand why meditation can be hard. The first thing is you need to feel safe to meditate. So it's called, we should be in a well-contained place. But basically you should be able to feel like you can go deeply inward and you're not gonna be in danger doing that. You know, that by kind of um, disengaging from your senses, you're not under physical threat by disengaging from your mental gross consciousnesses that you're not going to um, go into any kind of anxiety. And then we should go, we should have little desire, be stable. So, you know, you can't meditate well if you're really, really hungry. Um, you can't meditate well when you're really absorbed in some sort of exciting activity. Um, and so having little desire is something that is our life's work, but basically it means stop feeding the beast. Okay, so it's not like you have to um, suppress the desire that you have. It's more that to consciously stop chasing and reinforcing all the kind of like sensory attractions that your mind could have. Don't add anything. Let what's there gently integrate, subside, lose its shine, break the spell, and try not to add anything to your life that's going to inflame your craving. We should be satisfied with sense objects, meaning cultivate this contentment that says what I have externally and what I have inner internally is enough. And it's not a complacent feeling. It's a sense of it's enough for me to progress along a spiritual path with. You know, I have enough resources outside. I have enough internal resources of, you know, intelligence and health. I have enough. And if you can sit in that contented space, it can help you feel empowered to actually progress. And then we should avoid distracting work, which is easier said than done. But similar to desire, it's trying not to seek distractions. You know, there is enough distracting in our life and work already. But then sometimes during our break time, we're scrolling through this news article and that news article, half reading them, half thinking and talking about them. And then we're on to the next and scrolling and scrolling, looking for happiness, looking for entertainment. And that keeps us hyper stimulated. And it makes settling down even more uncomfortable, even though once we actually get to peace, it's a great relief. The transition is a lot more awkward if you're hyper stimulated. So trying to have some focus in your daily life. Um, morally pure is a very religious sounding term, but what it means is ethical. And how does ethics tie into concentration? I think of what your mind does when it's not ethical. The kind of dance of um, distraction and disassociation and excusing yourself and justifying yourself and explaining yourself to yourself so that you can keep being naughty. You know, that's a very agitated mind. So if you're living ethically, you don't have um, so much to keep you up at night. You don't have so much to worry you or um, to manage because it's just like there's you, you don't have kind of a shame flood or um, anything to kind of deal with in that sense. So just living ethically itself brings concentration. And of course, to be ethical, you need concentration. So they reinforce each other. And then the sixth one is avoiding superstitions that make us attached to sensory objects. So, you know, basically trying to stay calm, which is easier said than done, but sometimes we actually look for things to disturb our calm because we like the drama. So these are preliminaries to being able to concentrate. And this could be our work, you know, and then the actual meditation can come later. But what happens in real life is that we work on these at the same time as working on our concentration. It's not like first, second, it's like simultaneous. So we have this picture um, of the monk going up the trail. And a lot of you guys have seen this before, I'm guessing, at different Dharma centers. But it's basically the monk is you. And this little monastery down at the bottom 
represents renunciation or the determination to be free from samsara. And you need to want to be free of negative habitual thinking in order to progress along the path of concentration to a past a certain extent. So that's kind of the starting place. And then you are the little monk going through the path and um, the bends in the road, starting from the very first one by the monastery up to the guy who is um, sitting next to his sleeping elephant. These are the six powers that we need in order to develop this concentration. So we talked earlier about hearing and reflection. Then we have mindfulness and introspective awareness effort and complete familiarity up at the top. And this is what settles and deepens our concentration. And they get um, repeated in the image as well. So you're the monk going through the nine stages. What is key here is the hook and the rope. The monk is holding a hook and a rope. I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but the hook is the power of introspective awareness and the rope is the power of mindfulness. And what you're trying to do is rein in your senses, sometimes pulling back, sometimes pushing forward, right? Because sometimes you're too slack and slow and heavy, and sometimes you're too hyper and, you know, scattered and energized. So you need these two kind of tools to get your mind under control. And your mind being out of control is represented by the elephant and the monkey and the rabbit. So the elephant is like the heaviness and uh, the coarse laxity. The monkey is like your restlessness and your distraction. And then there's a tiny bunny, this little hair on top of the bum of the elephant up here. And that's subtle laxity. And that doesn't appear until later in your path. But that's when you're pretty focused, but there's just a touch of heavy and lack of clarity in your mind. And so that goes eventually as well. And then the fire um, is at different points on the path, which basically means you need effort in order to focus, but don't worry, it gets easier. So in the beginning, there's a big fire, you need a lot of effort, and then gradually you need less and less effort to stay focused. So that's um, good news. <laughs> okay, so here are the nine stages. And basically placing or setting shown here with the monk at the very base of the trail or the path, you have to put your mind on the object. You know, you have to think of your image and then hold the image. Then you have to con continuously hold the image. And then you'll, you know, you get distracted, right? And so instead of saying, oh, I'm distracted, I'll stop. Or, oh, I'm distracted, that's interesting. You consciously come back and that's called replacement. And then close placement is when you're able to zero in and hold that object, but it takes quite a bit of effort. But you know, you're able to stay there. And then taming and pacification and thorough pacification, you're able to hold the image throughout all of this, but there's more and more clarity and less and less kind of push and pull of different distractions around the edges until you're finally able to have single pointed attention with perfect clarity and stability. Setting an equipoise, it's becoming much more effortless. And then, after that, you have actual calm abiding or serenity, which means not only is it effortless, it's blissful. Yeah, it's blissful and it's happy and your body is relaxed and happy and your mind is relaxed and happy. And more than regular happiness, it's this very blissful experience. And that's when you're able to focus as long as you want without any hardship to your body or mind. Okay, so that's just a really quick run through um, of that picture that you'll see at a lot of um, Dharma centers. But basically what you're saying is with single pointed concentration, there is a need for a lot of renunciation and prerequisites in order to hold still. Yeah, for us to hold still and focus on something right now, it has to be a very, uh, I don't know, stimulating attachment object. You know, you can focus on the whole Lord of the Rings series because it's so pretty, you know, but can you focus the same amount of time? Could you meditate for three hours? No, 
well, I mean, you could sit there for three hours, but could you actually meditate for three hours? No. Can you watch Lord of the Rings for three hours? No problem. Yeah. And be quite focused the whole time, right? And tell people very detailed things about the plot, interesting things about the scenery and the cinematography. You could say stuff about this or that actor. You got plenty of concentration when it comes to attachment objects. So it's not like we don't have concentration, right? It just is so used to needing stimulation and to be um, tempting all of our senses. And what basically happens is that we're focused when our eyes are happy and then our eyes get bored. Then our ears are happy and our ears get bored. Then, you know, we basically are pinging around our different senses, um, getting them kind of stimulated. And then eventually the stimulation wears off. And so we switch to another sense. And we just kind of playing with our senses all day, trying to stay entertained. Yeah. Hence why we need to sleep, right? And if you were an amazing meditator like Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you don't need to sleep because you don't have to recover from all the sensory stimulation of your day. Your meditation is enough to help you integrate all of your experiences because your real-time life gets integrated in real time. You don't have to recover because you're so present. Does it make sense? So when you're doing single pointed meditation, do very short sessions at first and stop before you get tired, you know, and then go to some analysis because analysis is more like how we already think. It's just slightly more disciplined. So if you can start with, you know, three minutes, single pointed attention, and it could be that the first minute is just breath settling that the middle minute is really your best concentration you can possibly do. And then the third minute is gently relaxing the object. Three minutes. But if you did it sincerely without giving in to your distractions, then you would gradually build your skill. Yeah. So lots of people can sit there focusing on the breath for hours and hours, but they're kind of half focusing on the breath, half disassociating, half dreaming, you know, hazy, sleepy, relaxed place, which is not meditation, or they're blanking out because they think meditating is to clear the mind or to empty the mind, which is not the case. The mind will quiet and the mind will subdue, but you're not going to like blank out all thoughts. You're just going to go kind of numb and static. And that is not useful or what is being suggested. And when we say meditating on emptiness, we're talking about meditating on the emptiness of inherent existence of all phenomena, which is a very high philosophical concept that means a deep understanding of interdependence, nothing to do with emptying out the mind. It's a huge misunderstanding, right? So when you're doing single pointed concentration, short and sweet, yeah, short and sweet, put a timer on your phone, you know, quit while you're ahead and know that the flow state of excellent concentration that you sometimes experience like reading and driving or doing certain kinds of art, when you get into a very focused flow state, you'll start to get into that focused flow state with meditation. And then that ability will then come back out into your daily life and make that more in a flow state and they kind of be mutually dependent and mutually beneficial. So you need stable concentration for actual spiritual realizations but even if you don't get them it's going to be really useful for your daily life does it make sense so that's meditation in a nutshell um or meditation 101 The image depicting the nine stages of mental abidance is found in almost all Tibetan Buddhist centers, in all Tibetan Buddhist traditions, and shows the stages of developing calm abiding or serenity, shine, shamatha. The image reminds us of the different things we need to do in order to develop along the path to achieving perfect concentration, as well as showing us the pitfalls and things to avoid. 
This should be reassuring for us, as this image is centuries old, and the problems that human beings experience in developing these practices are universal. At the beginning of this process, our mind is unruly and untamed, depicted by the crazed elephant and the distractible monkey. But as we progress, we bring our mind more and more under control until eventually we achieve what is called actual calm abiding or serenity. From this achievement, we can then bring our analysis into the stability of our single pointed concentration and bring them into union so that we have the union of calm abiding and special insight together, which makes both of them more powerful. The best object, of course, is the union of calm abiding and special insight focused upon the emptiness of inherent existence. From that place, cutting the root of samsara is inevitable. Before we go on to the path to achieve calm abiding, we need certain prerequisites, as described in the fifth paramita, the perfection of concentration. We should be in a well-contained place, have little desire, be satisfied with sense objects, and avoid distracting work. We should be morally pure and avoid the superstitions that make us attached to sense objects. Safe, stable, content, focused, ethical, calm. From there we develop renunciation, shown by the monastery. Then the first power, at the first bend of the path, the power of hearing instructions. The monkey and elephant represent our mind totally out of control. Coarse laxity is the elephant, restlessness and distraction is the monkey. The first fire is the biggest fire, showing the most effort is needed at the beginning. The monk is ourselves at this first stage of mental abidance, where we place the mind on its meditation object. And we have continuous placement, where the mind is able to abide in the object a little bit longer. We approach the second bend, the power of reflection. We hold the rope of mindfulness and the hook of introspection. At this point, subtle laxity appears, represented by the hair atop the elephant. The changing colors of the animals, as well as their looking backwards, indicates that we're bringing our mind more and more under control. We are also no longer chasing, but have actually restrained the mind. At the third bend, we achieve the power of mindfulness and use the power of mindfulness, and are at the stage of repeated placement and close placement, able to recognize when the object is lost and reset attention on it, as well as strengthen mindfulness so it can remain longer and longer without distraction. The monkey of distraction and restlessness has been completely subdued. Then we have the stage of taming and then pacifying, which are driven by the power of introspective awareness. We stop wandering and so can remain on the object almost continuously. Then we abandon all resistance to concentration, identify laxity and restlessness before they arise. Then the stage of thoroughly pacifying and making single pointed, driven through the power of effort, where only a little effort is needed at the beginning of the session. Then placement in equipoise, through the power of complete familiarity, we achieve pliancy, and no effort is needed to maintain mindfulness and introspective awareness. The mind habitually remains single pointed. Then we have calm abiding serenity. Both physical and mental pliancy and bliss have been achieved. The monk rides the completely pacified elephant by attaining the union of serenity and insight with emptiness as the object. The monk holds the sword of wisdom. Ignorance, the root of samsara, is now in the process of being cut. With extremely powerful mindfulness and wisdom represented by the flames, the meditator continues to meditate on emptiness. With his mind informed by bodhicitta, he eradicates all defilements from the mind.